Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this episode of Existence. My name is Evan Liao. This podcast is about conversations, seeking to discover the essence of what it means to pursue a life well lived through the contemplation of love, death, meaning, and existence. On today's episode, we have Dr. Michael Prisdia. He is a philosophy professor at Arizona State University, as well as an experienced speaker and corporate consultant. His talks and writings have addressed the nature of consciousness, where he integrates work being done within the disciplines of philosophy, psychology, cognitive science, and physics. Dr. Prisdia holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy, as well as a PhD in American cultural studies from Bowling Green State University. I'm immensely grateful that Dr. Prisdia was able to sit down and uh, find the time to talk with me while I was in Arizona, and I'm really stoked to be able to share the conversation with you guys. It was great just to sit down and get to know him and talk about all the things that interest me pertaining to consciousness, meditation, mystery, and really just what we're doing here. This is really fun and extremely interesting and engaging uh, conversation to have, and I hope you get as much out of it as I have. I appreciate you guys listening. And hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you, Dr. Prisdia, for joining me here on, on this episode. Do you, I just kind of want to get a backstory about who you are, just to start off, kind of what you've done, uh, what your career looks like uh, up until this point. Um, so if you don't mind kind of, kind of sharing with uh, the audience kind of what, what you've, you've done up until this point in your career. I thought you might ask that question. Yeah. Well, let me just do a brief little bio, I suppose. I'll start at the beginning. Yeah. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, uh, real blue-collar, working-class family background. Mm -hmm. um, and my career-wise, I started as a landscaper, actually, as a very young man. I think I was like 15 years old when I started working. And I miss those days, by the way. I miss having my hands in the soil and working outside. It was a, it was a great time. Um, but right away I decided to, uh, I knew I would go to college. It, it was insisted upon by my, my mother, uh, and father. Um, and so I decided, okay, if I'm going to do it, I'll do it all the way. I, I kind of knew I'd wanted a doctorate right away. I had a little goal for myself to receive my doctorate before the age of 30, which I was, I was able to do. Um, I got lucky actually. I, uh, finished my bachelor's degree and I majored in philosophy of all things, which right there, I went to Lewis university, which is a small private school uh, run by the, um, Christian brothers outside of Chicago. And, uh, I was, I think it was like the first philosophy major in, I don't know how many years, nobody made small school, maybe 1500 students at the time. The class sizes I had were like eight to 10 people, which was wonderful. I mean, I got to meet my, got to know my uh, philosophy professors quite well. We have lunches and dinners at their home. So it was just a fabulous liberal arts education. Wouldn't have traded it for the world. So I got lucky. And then I went right into graduate school. I did my master's in a year at Bowling Green State University, uh, which is in Ohio. Great school, by the way, as well. And there again, I was lucky because I don't know if it's this way anymore, but I received a teaching assistantship. So... I was able to get all my tuition paid for, and then they paid me on top of that to just teach courses, you know, as a graduate student. So I did that and got that done in a year and then just kept going, went into the doctorate at Bowling Green State as well. But then when that finished up, it was, it's kind of a strange story. I was sharing an office with, uh, with an old hippie from the 60s, you know, and uh, she was always saying to me, you, you, you're different. You, you belong on the Indian reservation. You, you belong in Arizona and... Uh, interesting person but i finally took her up on her offer i said well do you have any connections out there i mean i realized that if i stayed in um, ohio with my friends a lot of people never finish their doctorate they just kind of screw around and you don't actually finish that dissertation so i thought to myself well maybe if i go to the indian reservation i go to arizona i'd have some peace and quiet and i won't be distracted i'll get the thing done so i took her up on it and uh, at the time, I, I bought a pickup truck. I had a fiancé at the time. We traveled across the country to meet this woman in Arizona. And when we got here, she wasn't here. <laughs> this is before cell phones. So she it took a job in, in Michigan and didn't couldn't locate me, you know. So I'm out there in Arizona with no connections. Uh, wound up, 
my fiance said, well, I've got an aunt and uncle in Phoenix. I mean, maybe we can stop in and get our bearings straight down there. So we literally drove the car all the way down, blazing hot summer, you know. I had never experienced heat like this. I came in August, opened, and we're in Flagstaff. That's the last time we received gasoline was up in Flagstaff. And then I remember driving and down the highway and seeing a palm tree for the first time. Going, oh, wow, this looks, this looks nice, you know. And we opened the door and got hit by that blast. And I remember my fiance saying to me, I'm not going to like it here. Because <laughs> what I thought is, anyway, there's a, there's a whole story here. I, I uh, wound up meeting some interesting people as soon as I arrived. I knew, I knew my interest has always been on the fringe. So I knew that maybe academia wouldn't be the place for me. So I wound up uh, meeting some interesting people as soon as I arrived. I remember one day I was getting my hair cut, and this woman cutting my hair is like, well, you sound like an interesting guy. You need to meet so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And she's a real networker, you know? So she tries to say to me, you should talk to this psychiatrist and this psychotherapist and this and that, because she was interested in what I was interested in. Then she says, well, there's this other fellow here. He's not like the rest. He's a businessman, you know? So, so I just picked up this guy's card, and I said, well, that's interesting. He's not like the rest, you know? So... uh I call him up and we hit it off. And uh, next thing I knew, within a matter of days, we get this company going, Life Design Incorporated. We had another partner and the three of us wound up spending, like I said, at least a decade or more going around the country doing workshops in the high tech industry and corporations such as Honeywell and Motorola, Intel. And we were very successful because what we were able to do, we, we each had this skill, I think. We were able to take some fairly complex ideas and fringy notions and then simplify them just enough so that, you know, you're, you're getting this information to people, which is generally interesting, but you're doing it in a way that's digestible. It's not over their heads, you know. So we, we had phenomenal success at that. What, what was it exactly that you, you did? Yeah. Well, you mean, give me an example. Yeah. Well, yeah the, no. the, whole, the whole company was, was focused on, it's called Life Design Incorporated. And it was, uh, originally, it was a company that was designed to help people balance their professional, personal life. So a lot of life planning, things like this. And. But we wound up signing contracts with these companies to do curricula, you know, like uh, Honeywell would have people come to courses. Uh, all the employees at this is back in the 90s. All the employees were required to take so many courses, you know, so many workshops. And these were eight hour workshops or sometimes three day workshops. Uh, so they had to take courses in stress management or change management or strategic planning. Or, and so we offered all that. We offered the whole gamut. But that, but then that, that allowed me to take my work and let's say, um, at this point already, I was already reading a lot of, I had been reading a lot of philosophy, but also a lot of psychology. And I started a yoga practice and I was able to bring a lot of these notions into those workshops. Joseph Kemp was an example. I found his work when I was in graduate school and I really keyed in uh, on the contents of the book, The Hero of a Thousand Faces and The Hero's Journey. And, um, this is now everybody's doing this work, you know, but I was in on the ground floor with that. So we're able to take like that model, Joseph Campbell's model, and we're able to apply it within an arena, like say change management, you know? So that thing became a, a, a structure for like a three day workshop. Sometimes and we take people through massive change in the corporate sector and we say, well, you're on this journey, you know, and this is, this is what's going on. Point here is I just kept going, got the doctorate. Then I, without thinking, didn't go into academia. I just kind of, to use Campbell's phrase, followed my bliss. That's what Joseph Campbell used to always advise people to do. So I, that resonated with me, and I did that. And then 9-11 hit, and all of the, our training was considered soft skills. It wasn't, we were in the high-tech industry, but we weren't doing anything with data analysis or anything like that. We were just doing, we were focused on the people. In fact, one of our first workshops was for APS. It was called the Human Side of Reengineering, where, again, this is the 90s, where all of a sudden all these companies were, they, they, they called it tipping over. Back in the 90s, 80s, 90s, the, a lot of the companies were st in the high-tech industry were still structured in the militaristic way, top-dom, you know, information's at the top, trickles down to the bottom. The chain of command is very much f focused on what you find in the military. And then that all tipped over to the whole teaming environment. It went horizontal. It tipped over. So all of a sudden in the 90s, there's this emphasis on creating teams and teamwork and restructuring organizations around teams and units and that stuff. But at the time, um, going through that, 
uh, APS, which is the country's largest nuclear power plant, they had a tough time re-engineering the entire organization. So you had nuclear physicists who were committing suicide because they were out of work or they, you know, they were concerned about their future. So there was a lot of mental stress placed on these employees, and we came in to kind of help them navigate through that. So the human side of re-engineering. So these are the kinds of examples. These are the kinds of things I was doing back in the 90s. Yeah. Um, so anyway, to get, I'll finish my story here. Uh, after 9-11, that dries up, and uh, I think, well, maybe I'll take a peek and see if academia has changed, you know? And how old were you at this point? Uh, I was, uh, how old would I would have been? This would have been like, I think I was still in my 30s. Yeah. So, I don't know, late 30s. And, yeah, someone says, hey, there's a new uh, department opening up at ASU. It's brand new. Uh, it's interdisciplinary studies. Sounds right up your alley. And I, sure enough, I, I met the chair of the department, and that was it. It just became full-time. Back then, we... Our department, we may have had seven or eight people, full-timers. Now it's it's just this huge, huge, huge program, which it's been filled. It's been fun to, to help build. Been lucky that way, uh, getting in the ground floor of things like that. So, yeah, so I've been in academia ever since. And then how, how long has it been up until this point now that you've been in academia? Well, let's see. That would have been – I probably walked in onto the ASU campus somewhere like 2002, 2004 – Okay. I started as an adjunct for a couple of years. I think I've been lecturing full time since 2007. Okay, well, almost 20 years then. Uh, yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, um, awesome. And then, what what was it about you as a as a young adult that kind of drew you into philosophy in, in the beginning, and then up until this point now as a professor? Hmm. Well, when I was a young man, uh, I went to high school. Uh, I went to a public grammar school in Chicago. Grew up in the city. Then we moved out to the suburbs, and I was fortunate enough to get, uh, again, a really decent high school education. My mother somehow scraped together all her savings and put put us through these private schools. They were Catholic high schools, very segregated. It was all no, no women, just all guys, you know. Again, I don't even know if they do that anymore in Chicago. Maybe. I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but... Um, I just, I remember taking like high school English classes and watching the English teacher teach and thinking to myself, that looks fun, you know? So I knew right away when I was in high school, I wanted to be a teacher. And I knew right away, hey, I probably wouldn't make a lot of money. I knew I probably wouldn't get a lot of respect, but somehow it just kind of resonated with me. So I, so then, um, interestingly, I, when I was entering college, I was just going with the flow. All my friends were like, well, hey, what are you going to do? And they're, you know, oh, well, pre-law, pre-med, all that kind of thing. So I just went with business, you know, not knowing anything about what, what to experience on a college campus. But I'll never forget taking my first philosophy 101 course. So here I am, a business major. And I take this course and it doesn't take long for me to say, oh, my, this is, this is fun. You know, <laughs> this is different. This beats the heck out of marketing 101, you know. So I, I right away decided to major in philosophy and came home one day and made that announcement. And thank God my mother was intelligent enough to say, oh, it's your life, you know. Do what you want. I'm not going to force you to do anything you don't want to do. So I just followed my bliss. And then, uh, so I just resonated with philosophy for some reason as, as a young age. And then how has that progressed since then? Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, um, oh, that's a good question. I just have never stopped reading philosophy. St- st- discovering Eastern philosophy opened up a whole new realm for me. And then, st- and then practicing yoga also opens up a new realm. I guess I just, uh, just stuck with it. And, um, I always knew that I couldn't work for somebody else. I, and so academia kind of allows you to be your own boss. You've got, I, I needed, I needed creative, I needed space to be creative and be my own boss. And lecturing allows you to do that for the most part. So I just kind of, that's what I did. I just kept reading and I just wanted to make sure I was creating. Yeah, definitely. I mean, creative, being a creative person in general, I think it looks so, it looks so different for so many people. I think when I grew up, I, I, a lot of the times I just kind of assumed like, oh, creative people are the people who do art or do, um, you know, I don't know, do make videos or whatever, our cinematographers, you know, whatever, whatever it is, but creativity looks so different and, and, and it, and it is so, it's dependent on who you are and what, what you find interesting. And then the creativity kind of flows from there, kind of, 
um, allows you to to think differently within the the space that you you try to operate in. And so, absolutely, um, for me, that's kind of been something that I've been discovering about myself as somebody who never typically considered himself a creative person, but then started realizing that there are so many creative uh, endeavors that I, that I do enjoy uh, putting effort into. And um, I think creativity is such a, it's such a, yeah, it's really a beautiful thing. Oh, not to be, I mean, it, it's, to me, it's one of the most important things in life. I don't think we emphasize it enough in our culture, to be honest with you. Cool. So then what, what was it? You mentioned Eastern philosophy. What, what was it exactly that about Eastern philosophy that differed uh, or that, that stood out to you as particularly salient compared to, to Western philosophy? Yeah, I, I think overall, um, I was going to say it has more depth. It's, you know, it, how do I put this? Not that Western philosophy doesn't have depth, but it's like the Eastern side of things was ahead of the game. It's, it took Western philosophy a long time to catch up to where the uh, early Hindu and Buddhist philosophers were hundreds of years ago. Do you ever think it fully caught up? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. Absolutely. You can, you can, get, you can, get, you can go to the same depth. East or West, doesn't matter. And what is, what is the distinction for you? Uh, again, I think the East, there's more of an emphasis on on action, on doing, on practicality. So again, you, you'll see there's an emphasis on having some kind of a meditation practice that comes out of the Eastern way, uh, some kind of a yoga, again, coming out of the Eastern way, whereas the Western side of things seems to be more having to do with the intellect and not as much with yoga intellect and action, you know? Or put it this way, um, you know, here in the West, we like to think, 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 think. And in the East, they put an emphasis on the importance of quieting down thought <laughs> so that a whole new dimension may open up. Yeah. Quieting down thought. Yeah. I mean, that's something I, I, I take immense interest in, just someone who, who does have a, a meditation practice that I, I take quite serious for myself. And, you know, it's something that I, I put a lot of effort in, into understanding more just the nature of consciousness and kind of, and where it leads you mm-hmm. when you start to understand how your entire experience is dictated by your own ability to perceive awareness. Mm-hmm. And so that's, I mean, that's like the way I kind of started thinking about this, these sorts of questions, because for, for some backstory or some context for my own self, I, I was kind of um, on a trip. I, I took off, I used to, so for myself, I, I used to, I used to live in California and I was in the military for like five years. And I used to, after I got out, I worked for um, a big aerospace company, Northrop Grumman. And I found no enjoyment out of it. I, it was absolutely abhorrent to me. I, I just did not resonate with that sort of culture, that sort of work at all. Uh, just creating, um, you know, kind of funding the military industrial complex. And, right. And, and just having a, you know, playing a, a part in the, in the big machine of that, it just didn't resonate with me as well as a lot of other things that kind of affected my own life that I, I felt just weren't right for me. So I ended up just taking off um, on a motorcycle trip with my friend, sold everything I owned, just kind of took off around the U.S. Mm. Uh, on the back of a bike. And throughout that experience, traveling through the U.S. for, for about four months, I, I came to the realization that I, I kind of just realized like what? What are we doing here? You know, like it, it was. It was this moment, and I, I can point to to spe- a specific day in my life where where I just kind of I just woke up in a sense. And uh, there's that Camus quote that's like um, you're like going every day. I don't know the exact quote, but it's like you're, you're waking up every day doing the same thing, and then all of a sudden oh, yeah. you wake up and everything you know experience kind of comes the, to you. The myth of Sisyphus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and so I had that and. Every single day from then on just changed for me. It just mm. completely set me out on a completely different path um, than I had. I had no, and I know had no idea what that path looked like, and I had no idea that path would even exist for me because I never thought of myself as interested in any of these sorts of topics before. And so, moving along forward through my life after that point, after really this whole trip through the U.S., it's just it's changed me entirely. And I've tried to educate myself and, and, and continue to educate myself like we everyone does every day in just learning more and more about w- what we're doing here and, and what, is, what, it, what it looks like for every individual person on this pursuit towards existence. So hmm. that's like kind of where I come from. And, and that's why, you know, I, I come to you to just 
reach out to different people, professors um, in philosophy and, and people who know so much more about this than I do, uh, just to kind of gain more of an insight and an under- understanding about somebody who's done this um, as a career. Yeah. Can I, how, how old were you when you had that wake up? Call? I was 23. Yeah. So remember I was mentioning earlier to you, Joseph Campbell, in that book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces and that model. That book, that opened up doorways for me. And it would re- if you read it, I'm positive you would resonate with it because the whole concept there, I mean, Campbell was a mythologist. I mean, he basically took myths and fairy tales and legends from all different time periods and different geographical locations, put them on the table and compared them and, and discovered they were telling one story. He calls it the monomyth. Characters' names change and look at, you know, but it's just one basic story. And uh, he had, and it's, it's, it's all about the notion that a human soul is on a journey and doorways open up as long as you're true to your own calling, you know, to your own you know, calling is a good word. Yeah. And, and so the whole book, I think, opens people's eyes with regard to what you were alluding to there. You know, you're, you're on one journey and then some little incident could be an accident, could be a tragedy, who knows, but something happens in your life that all of a sudden a new doorway opens up and you walk through and, boom. and then that journey can intensify as long as you, you know, you're, you're doing things that are resonating with your, your inner life calling. Yeah, totally. Um, and it looks different for everybody. Every journey, oh, every absolutely. journey looks completely different. You know, I think that's what's so interesting for my own self is just kind of understanding. And this is the, why I started the, the podcast at all is because I, I'm just interested in other people's journeys, you know, other people's interests uh, and, and progressions through life that, that look different from my own. And, you know, I, I can only come at it from, you know, this, this one subjective experience. So trying to, to, to put something out there that, that gets the um, ideas and, and the life of somebody else um, and, and to share that with somebody else, with other people who listen to this, that's, that's why I do it. It's and not that, for any And that's other. valuable. That's great. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. It, it's um, in addition to that, I just, I love talking to people. I just love conversation and I find so much value in it because I know for my own self, I wouldn't have come to any of the realizations that I have come to and, and matured in the way that I have without genuine, honest, and and self-reflective conversation mm-hmm. with other people. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I find so much value in that. So, you know, it's an, and partly another reason why this is, this is even going on at all too, because mm-hmm. it's another excuse to kind of get me out there uh, and, and, and just to talk to other people in a way mm-hmm. that I think brings more genuine conversation to the world. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, what is, what is your experience been with conversation? Well, you know, that's a good question as well. I, um, I have to say that despite all the reading I've done and, uh, and I, and I do value, I do value time by myself. Um, I do take time out, you know, hopefully once a day to have some time and space to myself so I can, as you say, reflect. It's important. But, uh, yeah, but, um, over the years I've noticed that I'm resonating more with, I don't, I, I'm not going to say I'm falling out of love with information and knowledge, but it's less important to me these days as opposed to communication. Learning how to communicate more effectively with people is for me, that's my, that's my new focus is helping people communicate more effectively, bottom line. So one of the things that I found really valuable in doing that is this dialogue process, going around the country, helping people communicating with this it's not really a formal process but uh should i talk about this really yeah go ahead please i I mean to go into some detail here yeah years ago when i was doing that corporate work i was doing one of our clients was aps and an executive took a shining to me and you know i was at his house one day and we're chatting and having tea or whatever and he says hey you i was just given this book by Michael Murphy. Michael Murphy by the way was the guy who started the Esalen Institute in California about back in the 60s um, what is it? What, Essel, the Esalen Institute? What is that exactly? Uh, well, it's kind of like it was one of the first, I don't know what to call it. Like not, you would call it today like a new age place where people go to do workshops and do self self introspective work. Uh, and, but a lot of famous, um, international speakers would go through there. Alan Watts did a lot of workshops oh, there. Wow. Joseph Campbell did a lot of workshops there. I mean, Stanislav Grof. So to this day, it's, it's still there and thriving, I believe. I think I've actually might've heard of it. Yeah. yeah it's, um, 
Big Sur, right outside of Big yeah, Sur. Yeah, actually, I know exactly where it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen, I've looked at it, actually. Yeah. So anyway, this guy says to me, Michael Murphy just handed me this book, and he was down at APS doing a workshop, and I thought you'd like it. And the book, it was all, it was this little pamphlet, and it was just called On Dialogue by David Bohm. Now, I knew Bohm was a physicist, a quantum physicist, but I had no idea what this book was. I opened it up, and sure enough, it just struck, you know, just struck me. I was like, wow, this is really intense. This is really interesting. Bohm, by the way, was a, I guess you'd call him a student of Jiddu Krishnamurti, uh, the Indian sage who lived in Ojai, California. Um, the two of them did these, they did dialogues together. The quantum physicist Bohm, the Indian sage Jiddu Krishnamurti. And over the years, they did a number of very, very, very interesting dialogues. And um, so Bohm learned how to dialogue with Krishnamurti and uh, perfected the art, writes, writes this book. And he says, you know, he says he wrote the book because he's troubled by what's going on internationally in the world. You know, people can physicists can't talk to each other, you know, without... You know, he used to give the example of Bohr and Einstein, you know, uh, not e- not being able to chat with each other and break through, you know, get past their obstacles to each other's work. And so anyway, um, he was taken by what Christian Murdy was doing and what they were doing in dialogue with each other. He writes his book and it's kind of like a handbook, like, OK, let's try this. Let's see if we can get some people in a room and go through this. Again, it's not a formal process, but it does have a bit of a structure. You, you sit in a room and you do and don't do certain things. The, the main thing you do is you suspend your assumptions. Everybody comes in with these assumptions and you, you, you need to be aware that that's what's going on. And you just suspend your assumptions and you don't suppress them. You don't repress them. You, you look at your – he just says, you know, take a look at your assumptions and just – Chris Murray used to say, put them in your hands as if they're rare jewels, you know, diamonds. And you – Look at every aspect of your assumption. Just really look at it. Just, just, just learn from looking, observing, being aware of your assumptions. And there's a lot of gold in that. So you don't try to repress them, suppress them, act on them. You just kind of... So the whole process of dialogue uh, is based on people in a room doing what I just said, hopefully learning how to suspend assumptions, and just talking to each other in such a way that there, there, there's a potential to have a discovery made. Some kind of discovery might come out. Bohm in the book makes a distinction between discussion, percussion, and, and dialogue. See, a discussion is, he says, it rhymes with the word concussion, you know? So there's a lot of uh, back and forth, a lot of banging. Whereas in a dialogue, you don't do that. You, it's, it's a smooth flow of information, again, based on suspending your assumptions. And he says, if you can do that, every once in a while, you can make a true discovery. Something new will be learned. You never learn much in a discussion. I, I can I could attest to that. I remember being a college student and sometimes taking courses where, you know, like Monday and Wednesday was a lecture and Friday was discussion day. You'd go to discussion day and the professor would say, okay, discuss. And I hated those courses because I learned nothing. I mean, one person stands up and says or sits down and says, this is what I believe and starts foaming at the mouth, you know, at some point. And then someone else says, I disagree. And then they're, so they start... And it gets heated sometimes, you know, and they almost want to throw something at each other, you know, but they don't. But it's just this back and forth verbal conflict. And then the bell rings and the period's over and you get up and go, wow, that was a waste of time. I learned what Susan thinks. I learned what Bobby thinks. But And they don't like each other and they have different thoughts. <laughs> but I learned. So Bohm's point is, you know, in a dialogue that's ideally not going to happen, you're you're not going to be. If you suspend your assumptions and you're aware of that, then you're not going to just act on those assumptions. You're going to be aware of that. Okay. So you slow everything down. You slow everything down. Uh, you do try to quiet your thoughts. This is all part of it. So that work, that work is important to me. It's, it's less about me sharing information as opposed to me facilitating a back and forth of information so that potentially something new could be discovered, whether it's a group of you know, 50 people or 20 people or two or three people. It doesn't matter. Totally. And I'm sure your background from in academia as a professor it shapes this uh, immensely. Uh, yeah. How you kind of facilitate conversation in this. Yeah. Way. Although it's not necessary. I mean, if you had a background that was, uh, if you have a background in philosophy, it helps. But, you know, so does a background just having some kind of meditation practice or some kind of yoga practice. I think, I mean, um, more towards like a, a, a teacher, you know, as somebody oh. that wants uh 
productive uh, facilitation of, of oh yeah you know? yeah 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 i would agree yeah no totally i mean i do um i do resonate with it with uh what you talk about um because you could have like unproductive conversation <laughs> and then you could have uh, yeah. productive discussion so that's what i'm saying um, yeah. you know there's there's definitely i mean i think i think that's also such a root of what inhibits so much of culture and society from gaining any progress um now especially i mean it's probably always been this way but you know i you know i only can speak from it from my perspective but um you know you look on the news you look at you know different channels fox news cnn or whatever whatever pick any any news channel you want like there's always they're always trying to push an agenda their way um and there's never any there's never any thought or consideration for the other side a genuine thought genuine this like you like you said like this suspending of your own assumptions and and genuinely trying to put yourself into the perspective of another person i was going to say the thing is listening I, when i was speaking of dialogues earlier I, I i should have mentioned the importance not just of suspending assumptions but along with that is listening with awareness see it's so key when as you're saying you're you're cuz otherwise it's not going to be productive two people are having a conversation about anything you have to be able to listen with awareness. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, to make your point, most people, when someone's talking to them and they're, they're listening, they're not listening. They're, they're thinking in their heads about that. You said something maybe that uh, scares me. So now I have fear or you say something that, that I like that I, I'm, you know, pulled, to, I desire to say more, you know, fear and desire. Most people are trapped by fear and desire. And um, that, that shuts, that just shuts things down. So you're, you're talking. I'm supposed to be listening, but now you said something that scares me. So now I'm going. I've got a dialogue in my head, thinking, "Oh no, no." You're, st- but I'm missing everything you're saying because I'm thinking. I'm not listening. My point is, I'm not listening. I'm thinking with my motor running, you know, or I'm listening with my motor running, which means I'm thinking while you're speaking. And to me, that's that's it. That's the big obstacle. People don't listen with awareness. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a very big. I think that's a very big point you bring up. Um, it's huge, and it's something that I. I do my best to recognize within my own self because we're all guilty of it. Sometimes, you know, you could be the best listener in the world, but like sometimes it, it, like you said, there's kind of this, this motor running in the back of your head. That's, that's just um, on the precipice of saying something, just about to say something. And so recognizing that, but I think it's the difficulty in, in learning how to recognize that. Um, What do you think the challenges are for people that, that want, or, or at least that feel this, Feel this uh, turning in the back of their head. What, well, what is it? That's great. I mean, let me just let me just answer that with uh, quickly with this kind of a response. I think what happens to most people is, as you said, everybody's guilty of listening with their motor running, which means again, I'm supposed to be listening to you. You're saying something that draws me toward what you say or repels me, fear or desire. So now I'm thinking. You're speaking. I'm thinking. I'm not listening. Right now, you just said, okay. Now let you know. You said something, I thought you said something like, okay, now I've noticed I do that. I right, now everybody does it. And it's very important to notice that you're doing it. Ideally, right in the moment. Like if we were in a, a formal dialogue and all of a sudden um, you're saying something to me and I'm watching that, I'm watching, because it's all about watching, observing, awareness. I'm watching that I'm no longer listening, but thinking. Now the next thing you do, see your question kind of comes down to, well, now what? You know, it, as long as I'm aware that I'm thinking, you know, instead of listening, that's all that's net necessary there. The trap people get into is, oh no, teach me what I need to do to listen with more awareness. You know, what are the steps? What do I need to do to be more aware, to be a, a better listener? And that's, that's a dead end. It's cause it's not about taking time and steps to go to pay attention. You just pay attention. So the secret is you just notice when you're not paying attention and you're paying attention right there. There's no, there's no time necessary. There's nothing you need to do. Um, I used to teach all these active listening models. You know, there's four step models, six step models. Can I tell a story here to, to illustrate Please. what you just asked? I mean, this is, this is my way of answering your question. I don't even know if I am answering it or not, but um, no, you are. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, one of the things we used to do in life design, that company I mentioned to you, we were on the own country doing those workshops and uh, we had an active listening workshop. And as I recall, it, it was a four step model. H E A R here, here, the other person. 
uh, H, it's four steps. H was hear the other person. E was explain your understanding of what you thought they heard or what they what you thought they said. A was ask questions, and R was respond or do something. So anyway, we'd spend a whole day on this, going through all those four steps. And and uh, I remember, you know, well, let's say we do that workshop on a on a Tuesday at the beginning of the month, and then I come back to Honeywell and I'm doing another workshop on another topic later on in the month. And let's say I'm walking down the hallway and I see a participant in that first workshop, the active listening workshop. And I say, Hey, Hey John, how's it going? How, how, how how's the listening going? Are you guys uh, working more effectively now? And a lot of times I'd hear, no, it made it worse. It didn't work. And I, and I, I was like, wow. All right. Well, I took that seriously after I get a, a number of those kind of responses. And I remember thinking to myself, why doesn't this thing work? I mean, it looks pretty simple to me. And we, I thought we made it seem simple, you know, and it, it flowed and I thought it had a track record, but I was getting these, this feedback. No, it's in fact, now you've riled us up. Now we're, you know, now we feel like we're failures or something like this. You know, there were, there were all kinds of responses I would get from these ex participants. But anyway, one day I'm laying in bed and I'm really <laughs> I'm meditating on this because it bugged me, you know, because I was, we were getting really good money too, by the way, you know, it's just like, you feel kind of guilty, you know, like, so one day it, it hit me as if I thought to myself, I know why it doesn't work. No one does step one. No one takes the H. No one hears the other person. Step one is shut up and listen. And then you can explain what you heard, ask questions and respond. But if you don't do step one, the whole thing just dissolves right away. And I was convinced that no one did step one. So my point is, this is called an active listening model. And there's a whole, I'm sure they're still selling books. You know, someone's writing a book as I speak and how to be a better active listener. And maybe he's got seven steps instead of four. But, but if you don't do that first step, which is basically amounts to just shut up and pay attention to what they're saying. To me, it all came down to, well, we don't need to be active listeners. We need to be passive listeners. We, that's, that first step is the key step. And then we can think about what we heard, but you don't want to think until step two. Step one is, you know, just listen. So that was a real eye-opener for me. That That's what we need to do. And that's what motivated me to then take that Bohm book, that on dialogue book, and look that look at that more closely and second, how can we... Because that's basically what he's saying, too, in a nutshell. He's like, yeah, we... We're not, what I want to say here, and this, I think this is, this is worth talking about. We don't pay enough attention to what thought is doing. Now being, coming from a philosophy background, I've, I've, all I've done is read, you know, these really complex thoughts from different philosophers, East, West, also psychology, whatnot, you know? So the world is filled with thoughts, but it's interesting Human beings will pay attention to almost everything other than thought itself. If you've ever noticed, you really don't see people paying attention to what thought is doing to them. You know, we were talking about med- you mentioned, or one of us mentioned meditation a while back, and there are all kinds of different ways to meditate. I, I used to make a list for my students in my, I teach a course here at ASU called The Nature of Consciousness, and we go over meditation a little bit. And I, I came up with this. This is just me, by the way. These are my own little categories here. But I thought there's different ways, different types of meditation. Uh, one is simply trying to control thought. This has its roots, by the way, in shamanic journeying. You know, shamans and the traditional cultures would go on these visions. They'd see, you know, they, they weren't necessarily dreaming, but they would be awake and then have a vision. And... And that, so this, what comes out of this is what we call today uh, visualization meditation, guided imagery meditations, where someone shuts their eyes and goes to their favorite happy place, a bubbling brook or, you know, a spring or something. And back in the 90s, you know, in the workshops, we'd put some music on and we'd say, okay, now visualize this, you know. But all these guided imagery exercises, these visualizations, they come out of shamanic journeying, which is all about, you know, uh, controlling thought. You know, making thought do something, you know. So, so, and that works, by the way. I mean, there is just reams of studies that, that demonstrate this helps with our blood pressure, our stress reduction, um, biorhythms. Define controlling thought. Well, I, well, that's a good question. By that, it's really simple. It, it, it'll make more sense if I share the other types of meditation, but 
in this kind of meditation, you, you're just closing your eyes and, and you're kind of guiding your own thoughts, right? Like, okay, you're go, you're going to a river that you, that brings you peace or you're um, visualizing athletes do it all the time. I mean, uh, I remember in the 1980 Olympics, the Russians were talking about how they were training. Um, I forget what particular sport, but a lot of people started to scientifically study this stuff back in the 80s. And in this country, um, psychoneuroimmunology is what comes out of this, this idea that the mind-body connection, we can take our mind and, and control our body with our mind, you know. So athletes, you know, Arnold Palmer getting on a, on a putting green and visualizing the putt before he takes it. That's, that's what I mean by controlling thought. More of like a following thought through its like full, I guess, kind of its, its, its path through whatever, instead of just recognizing it yeah. and, and letting it, kind of holding it more as an object and letting it pass, uh-huh. like actually following it. Is yeah, that what you're that, saying? Yeah, that's good. It's, it's kind of like both. It's both. So you, you kind of mold it. You kind of mold your own thought. So if you want to be more effective at a particular sport, you visualize yourself being effective at that sport. And what we learned back in the 80s, 70s and 80s is this, this scientific phrase that used to be batted around. I'm not sure if anybody uses the phrase psychoneuroimmunology anymore, but the mind-body connection, the idea that you can't separate the mind from the body. Well, anyway, that, that's just one way to – this is a long answer to your question, but that's one way to people meditate. But it, then it dawned on me that there's another way to meditate, which is basically um, – intense concentration exercises or, or just basically trying to stop thought altogether. Now this comes out of Ashtanga yoga, the, the traditional yoga of Patanjali, the, the old time. No one knows when Patanjali lived, if he ever did actually live. He's a legendary a saint or a sage, but so we're talking hundreds and hundreds of years ago, Ashtanga yoga coming out of the Hindu tradition. It's all about stopping thought. The Yoga Sutras say, the second sutra says something like, yoga is the intentional stopping of the spontaneous activity of the mind stuff, of the mind itself. So you're trying to stop thought. Now, by the way, uh, some people are quick enough to notice that the thought that you need to stop thought is still a thought. So it gets a little bit subtle here. But that's another way to meditate. And then another way to meditate is what's called mindfulness today, which comes out of the Buddhist tradition, Vipassana, which is all about paying attention to the content of your thoughts and paying attention to your feelings, the environment you're in. You, you know, you pay attention to the sun and the sky or the, the peeling paint on the wall or the heat from the sun. You're just paying attention. You're, you're totally present where you are. That's mindfulness. And uh, this is just flowering in our culture right now. There are corporations which some of them require their employees to take mindfulness courses. And again, it works. You know, there's no doubt about it. It helps with your psychological stress and whatnot. Then there's another way to meditate. This comes out of the, the Hindu tradition again, but it's modern Hinduism. Well, modern for the Hindus, which is still hundreds of years old. But uh, self-inquiry comes out of uh, modern Advaita Vedanta. And this is a tricky one. This is where you, you search for the source of thought itself. So notice what we're doing here. First, we... The first type was controlling thought. The second type of meditation I mentioned was having to do with stopping thought. The third is paying attention to the content of the thoughts. And this one is, well, where does thought come from? What's the source of thought? Who's the thinker? So this comes out of modern Advaita Vedanta. Uh, There was a sage who passed away in 1950. His name was Ramana Maharishi. And he used to say to his followers, he said, just ask yourself the question, who am I? And dive into that question. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And you don't, you know, you ask the question and you don't think about an answer because you're going to come up with a thought and that's not going to be it because you're going to say, well, who just had that thought? Well, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the source of thought. So you just keep asking the question, who am I? Who am I? And you stick with that question. Again, don't rush to answer it because you're probably going to answer it by thinking about it and that's not going to get you anywhere. So you just kind of, he would just say, just keep answering, that, ask that question, and then see if it doesn't take you somewhere. So that's, that's, that's a practice. Now, it's, again, it's a little more subtle than that. He used to give that kind of a question to his, his uh, beginning followers, you know, those who were just starting their practice. But it, it, it has some validity. Um, I'll skip over some more, but th- there's another, another way to meditate that I like to bring here, which is finally getting to your question there. And I don't have a name for this one, but I'll define it this way. 
what if we started to pay attention to the function of our thoughts, how thought functions? So it's different than mindfulness because in mindfulness, you're paying attention to the content of your thoughts, what you're thinking about. With this approach, you're looking at what is what thought is doing. What is its function? And as I said a few minutes ago, yeah, what is it doing to me? Because if you really start to do this, if you, if you start to put conscious awareness on the function of thought, you'll notice that it's doing all kinds of things. And you, again, you just notice what it's doing, you know. But you, the key factor is, if you start to do this, this, this could be a real eye-opener. I, I think this has great promise for humanity. This is just me. Because as far as I can tell, hum, human beings have not spent a lot of time doing this. And this, by the way, is what Bohm is trying to, to teach in that book on dialogue. He, again, he learned this from Krishnamurti. The two of them, in their dialogues, would basically be sitting in a room together, paying attention to how they were thinking about what they were thinking about. And that, I think, has great promise. We don't want, maybe not, maybe we don't want to get into why I think that right now, but uh, it's worth a try. No, I completely agree. I mean, I think something that, the 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 perspective that I come from it at is more of the perspective, um, kind of marrying the, the concepts of like the Avaita Vedanta between, and what you just said, uh-huh. um, like the nature of your own self, um, like where, you know, if you keep asking yourself the question, who am I or who's thinking you'll, you'll just, you'll come up realizing that there is no answer there. There's no, mm-hmm. there's no self to find. Um, uh-huh. And I think that's really the, the deeper question of meditation is to, it's to kind of realize that it's come to those realizations that there is no, there's really no self there to find. That's what the but, Buddha said. Right. Yeah. And, and, but at the same time thought it exists as something it, it exists and this is kind of just me working through it in my own head right yeah, now. Yeah, this is good. We, um, this is what I'd like to do. This is kind of like what I, I value. What we're doing right now, as far as I, I like, I see it. Let's enter a dialogue right now. Yeah, yeah, you know? totally. So let's let's do this. Yeah, and so the way I the way I kind of think about it is, thought still serves a, a purpose, and but it's but it's recognizing what that purpose is, and 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 just kind of holding whatever may may come as like i said an like an object of consciousness that that is there to be noticed but not necessarily something to be identified with um so okay you, right so gotcha um that is kind of to say how our our relationships between thought and and what we're actually what we actually kind of would would want to play out in terms of our our own path I don't know if that that makes any sense more towards like the it's I think it just more speaks to like the role of what thought does. And and I kind of want to get your perspective on what you what the point of thought is for you. Uh-huh. Well, let's use an example then. Um you made the comment that you've discovered in your own meditation practice and and or maybe you've discovered it and also read about this, but the Buddha was famous for stating that hey, go look for yourself. You're not going to find a self because there is no self. And so I think you made the comment, yeah, a lot of people can get to that point in their meditation. You can, you can do self-inquire and ask the question, who am I? Um, but see, there's a fine line here, you know? I mean, so let's say that you, you read and understand the words of the Buddha. You, you get it. Okay, there is no self. The self is not a thought, okay? Somehow uh, the thought eludes the self. There's no relationship between the thought and, or, and the self. They're somehow not related. I think the next question is, well, well now what, you know, like, so I'll, I'll put it on you, Evan. All right. So you're a guy who maybe has meditated in this fashion before. And so somehow I'm, I'll just assume that somehow there is something to this statement of the Buddha, that there is no self that kind of resonates with you. There is no self. Now, a question I might ask is, well, now, what do you think about that? Or, or now what? I mean, does this make life meaningless? Does your, does your own identity have no value? Is there an identity? What, what happens to someone when they at least even intellectually understand the point that there is no self? Yeah, I mean, this is something that I, that I have thought about. And, and I think it kind of comes down to two things for me, or at least um, they're connected. One being... That there, even though there is no self, there's still consciousness that exists. There's okay. still some experience 
that exists, whatever that may be. Um, even if it, if, if whatever we see is an illusion, consciousness still exists, like the fundamental underlying of awareness. Um, and, and that has effects on the way that I progress through life. And, and then it's like, that kind of leads me into like the next thought is like, okay, now that I, now that I'm aware of this, how should I progress through life? Um, and so, you know, I think there's kind of like, in my head, I, I think of like two options. It's like, one is like completely devoid of, or devoid my life of anything that I find, I guess that I used to find valuable, you know, uh, and, and just go out into the, mm-hmm. the, the mountains of Nepal and meditate with the monks and, and mm-hmm. be within my, my non self for you know, the rest of my days. Mm-hmm. Or, I can interact with, with the thought. And I think this is kind of something that, that the, what, the way you're leading down more is like, how do you interact with thought now? Now that you, you're, you're not, you, you can, you can say like, Hey, I don't, I don't want the monk path, but now that only leads me with interacting with thought. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't know, like, but, but, but at the, the, the other question is like, well, what, what would bring happiness? Because, um, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for contentment in my life, you know? And it's like, I think that's, I think that's, um, uh, what, what so many people are, are, are striving for in their life is the idea of contentment. And I think happiness, and contentment are two different things, but, um, but like, what is a content fulfilling life look like? And is that completely getting rid of my own notion of the self or interacting with it in a way uh-huh. that, that brings me some, something of, of fulfillment. Yeah. Well, you know, the, it's been a few years, but the, the Dalai Lama wrote a book called the art of happiness. And he made the point that, you know, to be happy is, is, uh, I guess it's a goal, you know, it, it should be a goal that humans strive for. Um, but you know, some people make a distinction though between happiness and joy, happiness joy and pleasure they there, there's there's maybe some subtle distinctions there you mentioned contentment versus happiness or maybe it's the same thing but there we got to be careful though with language i think because for instance as you're talking about the self and you brought in consciousness let, let's let's clarify some terms here because i want to make sure we're on the same page yeah please so like there's the self with a small s we'll call that the ego what a psychologist would call the ego that's who we think we are you know i you know, it said that Freud used the term. Freud, I'm told that Freud never actually used the term ego. His his editor did to make him sound more scientific. Freud's Freud's term was ich, which just meant I, German for I. So ego is I. And I, I think, I, I teach a course, again, in consciousness studies, and I do bring in both psychology and then I bring in, you know, quantum physics and cognition and psychology. So one of the first things I do is I begin with the human psyche and I say, okay, there's the self with the small s. That's your ego. That's who you think you are. That's your identity. Okay. And that's the, the ego is what puts on masks, persona, you know, you put a mask on in one environment and take it off and put another mask on in another environment. And we call that a healthy Western psyche. As opposed to the East, by the way, you don't, they don't, they're not too adept at putting masks on and off, at least traditionally. I'm talking traditionally, but anyway, in the West, we call that a healthy psyche, someone with a healthy ego that creates a persona for one environment, wears that mask, knows to take it off. Like if I go home and I'm professor at home, you know, my wife is going to, you know, that's not going to be a long lasting relationship. You know, your, your, your husband, your student, your, your professor, it depends on the circumstances. Okay. That's set with a small S, but then you brought in the term consciousness. Now in the East, there's self with a capital S, you know, uh, Atman, Atman Brahman. And what this is, this is equatable with consciousness. So it's almost like, you know, if you're a psychologist and you're talking about consciousness, in my mind, that's referring to the self with a small S, ego, consciousness, waking consciousness. But in the East, they open this up and the self with a capital S is consciousness itself, the big C, you know. And again, in the Eastern traditions, consciousness is the source of the cosmos. It's everything. Again, as opposed to a typical scientific Western approach, there's two approaches to consciousness studies. And I made this up, but I think this holds some water. You can take the um, spiritual approach, which is coming out of the East. Consciousness is the source of the cosmos. Or you can take this more scientific approach, which we do find in, in Western materialism, where consciousness 
isn't the source. It's what comes out of matter. Matter's primary, and then consciousness emerges from the material and the matter, as opposed to consciousness being primary and matter emerging from the consciousness. That's the Eastern. A lot of people take a spiritual approach where consciousness is the source. So it's consciousness with a capital C. It's the self with a capital S. And I bring this up because, you know, we made the statement that the Buddha said there is no self. Now, a light went off in my head. I was like, now, what does Evan mean by that self? Is he talking the small s self or is he talking the large s? Because you had said, yeah, there, there could be no self, but then there could still be consciousness. So that made me think, okay, well, then wait a minute. He's not using the term self in a traditional Eastern approach because the self would be consciousness itself. Now, this is, you might think this is a minor point, but it's actually quite major. Um, because here we are, we're, we're talking, we're, we're, kind of in a way dialoguing here, maybe doing a little bit of meditation or verbal meditation. And we've discovered, hey, yeah, what if there's no self? What if the Buddha was correct? There is no self. Now I asked you, what does that mean? And then you say something like, well, there's still consciousness and I can still have a relationship to thoughts. But you see, if there is no self in the traditional Buddhist perspective, that means there's there's no self, period. End of story. There's no, that, that's you've dissolved into the cosmic sea, you know, that's it. You're gone. Uh, like, what do they say? Like a little piece of salt that dissolves into the ocean. There is no self. There's just nothingness. Um, there's just basically consciousness, they would say. Now, by the way, I don't think that's the end of the story. I'm just saying this is a traditional Eastern approach that there's just consciousness. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a, I think that's a great point. I, you know, I, and I, I guess I haven't really clearly defined it in my head yeah. with the way you, you yeah. brought up. Um, That's why I wanted to make that distinction. No, yeah, I think it is an important distinction. But I'm, Because I'm curious to see, I mean, I'm just, not to put you on the spot, but, you know, you, you seem interested in this topic and you've done some meditating. So let's carry this further. Okay, now we've discovered that there is no self and possibly that means, if you stay with the Eastern lingo, that all there is is consciousness. Okay, now what? Does this make an impact on our life? You know, what what's the effect of this discovery? Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes to the question of it. It, it kind of goes to the question of well, if it doesn't have any, you know, it's like regardless of what is true, like what effect does it have on your life? Okay. Um, and at least in my head, that's kind of where where I'm taking it. So it's like the so the, I guess I should kind of extrapolate on what I think about the self and like what I think yeah, because I, I'll is. just I I, let, I want to hear you but because yeah. the, qu- the question here is if there is no self then whose life are we referring to yeah no okay. I mean I think it's sort of like this universal consciousness All um, right. and you know I, this is something that I'm still you know I, I, I I'll probably die still thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know but but it's it's to me it's like kind of the journey of exploring that um yep, that's what it's all about and and if there is no self to find then what is this and and i think that's it's that is such that is a such a large question i'm glad you i'm glad you you did raise it in the way that you did um because it's not something i really thought about in that specific way so like okay so <laughs> there's no self then and then there can only be consciousness and and i think i think consciousness i think i i can think of consciousness in two ways one being that it's the like the fundamental the fundamental nature of reality is consciousness um and you could take that like to panpsychism but you could also take like you said like a materialistic approach to it yeah. um that consciousness or m- m- matter is primary matter is primary and so um I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I think at this point, like I, I genuinely, I don't, I don't necessarily have a, you know, I don't have a good answer for this, but I think this is, this is why it's important to talk about because there are, two, there are ways we can, we can, we can think about these things that, that have a profound effect on the way we, we navigate through life now. Um, but but yeah, and I, I think that's you know it's something I'll have to think about. And more. We, can, we can get off the subject too. No, but, no, please, I, but I enjoy I, the subject. I, I, uh, oh, you, you want to keep going with this? Yeah, uh, please. because <laughs> because uh, you know I teach again. I just I said this for the third time now. I I really enjoy teaching this course on consciousness at, at ASU here. I've been doing it for a while. I love it. And one of the things I try to make because I'm not writing, as I said to you, I think before we started to record, I'm I'm just 
My contract is a lecturer. That's what I do. I haven't written purposely. After I retire, hopefully I will be to get some writing done. But but when I teach, I, I really try to use language precisely. For instance, in the field of consciousness studies, which, by the way, is a very relatively new academic discipline. It didn't really get launched until the mid-1990s. Actually, right here in Arizona, there was a conference at the University of Arizona, a uh, famous conference. Stuart Hameroff, who's still there, he's an anesthesiologist down there, uh, he put on a conference. First time he brought... Uh, Anybody interested in the field of consciousness? Now, he he's takes more of a scientific approach, so he started to collect. But eventually, this conference is now huge. It's But back in the 90s, is scientists getting together, talking about the nature of consciousness. And there was a young man at the time from Australia. His name is Chalmers, David Chalmers, who is famous for a phrase for, I guess, introducing the phrase, the hard problem of consciousness. You know, how are we conscious? <laughs> What is, how are we conscious? That's basically the question. And that is now considered to be the hard problem of consciousness. He launched that. As I said, this conference is, is, is huge now. It's internationally um, famous. But I'm noticing people within, so that's what, that's what launched the discipline of consciousness studies. It's now, I feel like a pioneer. The fact that I'm teaching it, I feel lucky to be doing this and meeting all these really interesting people. I mean, the people you, you meet are just fascinating Again, very interdisciplinary, you know, quantum physicists, you know, cognitive biologists, uh, Hindus who have a meditation practice or whatnot. So, but I'm noticing the language is getting really slippery. Again, this is why I appreciate David Bohm's work as a scientist, I guess. He was very focused on precision and, you know, so he wa- he watched language a lot. And I'll just share something that I learned from him. And that I'm trying to teach my students as well or anybody interested in consciousness studies because there's a tendency in consciousness studies to blur a bunch of words together. Like, for instance, what is consciousness? I think for most people, they assume consciousness has something to do with awareness and also knowledge, knowingness. Somehow it's both. And and Bohm used to say, wait a minute, there, there's a big difference between awareness, which is watchfulness, and knowledge, which is a knowingness, and they're not the same thing. Uh, for instance, and, and both, but we call both of them consciousness. Some people think of awareness as consciousness. Some people think of knowingness as consciousness. Some people blur them together and say, oh, yeah, it's all one thing without even knowing that they're blurring these terms together, you know. But there is a distinction between knowingness and watchfulness. Knowingness is, is a knowledge. It's definitely a consciousness. For instance, uh, you eat a lunch and your body knows what to do to get to work on that. You know, the digestive juice is flowing, everything's going. That That's a form of consciousness. That's knowledge. The body knows what to do with food, you know. The stomach gets in there. So that's that's a form of consciousness, but it's a knowingness as opposed to awareness, which is what we've been talking about, paying attention, observing. Well, observing is different than knowing, you know. Now, it might lead. There's a relationship there, but, you know, you really do probably want to separate those two out and not necessarily blur them together. Yeah. Well, I think, I think kind of the way I think about it is, um, as you may, made reference to the hard problem of consciousness, um, the hard problem of consciousness, by my understanding, is kind of the, the relationship that consciousness has, why anything like our behavior or anything that could be associated with the consciousness gives rise to experience. Um, so like the, you could imagine like the, the philosophical zombie thought experiment mm-hmm. where, you know, you don't, you know, you, you have a, a, a being that seems to be conscious, but yet there's no lights on. Um, and so I think there's sort of, and, and, and feel free to correct me on this, I feel like there's some sort of distinction between the knowing, like you, you, you say a type of consciousness and a type of consciousness is, is not necessarily a type of consciousness, it's just an, an object of consciousness. It's something that consciousness produces. So knowledge with it would be within that. Um, gotcha. The knowledge of something happening, whether or not you know it's happening or not, like a biological system within us, our heart beating, our liver working, whatever, like that is still a part of what consciousness gives rise to. But it's not consciousness itself. Well, I make – I don't know. I The way I look at it is this. First, first off, I'm starting to come to the conclusion that it's probably best to – equate consciousness with experience and not as any kind of an object. Um, 
So I think there, there is safety anyway in saying, well, what if consciousness is just experience? It's not a thing, you know? Um, and so here I am using language, calling it this and this and this and that. Well, there's just the experience of observing. Um, anyway, um, so I think to answer your question, I, I think really basically consciousness is memory and, and that means consciousness is thought. I'm really, really, really pretty solidly convict. I have this conviction that it's probably safest to say consciousness is simply thought, but specifically memory, which means again, knowledge, right? Now, uh, awareness can lead to knowledge though. You can be watching something and then that becomes something that becomes part of what you know, I suppose. Now we, we're, we're counting, we're, we're discounting the whole experience of sensation, you know, so there, there's this, there's this flow, you know, um, perception, sensation, knowledge. When you say memory, um, yeah, memory. are you are you sort of, do you, are you sort of referencing, or at least, do you think about it in a way that consciousness is memory by virtue of the fact that everything that we could know is just kind of based on something like some yeah. antecedent cause? Yeah, I, I, I like again. I, I'm trying to be very careful in my old age with using language precisely. I'm trying to get comfortable with, in my own head with what makes sense to me. So for me these days, reality, reality itself. Let's talk about reality. Is simply what we think about. Now that's that's a huge broad definition. Reality is what we think about, and you could be thinking about um, a tree. You could be thinking about a unicorn. But you see now, in my definition, a unicorn is still real because it's something I'm thinking about. So reality is what I think about. Now, I like to make distinction between reality and truth. I, I like to think that truth is not necessarily, I'll put it this way, truth might be transcendent of reality, what I think about. I, I like to keep this open. There's what I think about, which is consciousness, which is past thoughts, memory. All right, there's that. But I'm also a big fan of believing that life is also grounded in a mystery, flat out, like you were making allusion to. It's, you know, we'll never, it's, mystery is fundamentally the ground of life, the cosmos, mystery. But there could be, there could be the possibility of truth existing separate from thought, All right, So truth with a capital T, I don't mean opinion. This is, this is the big fight that Socrates had with the sophists in ancient Greek philosophy, you know. Back then, the, it's kind of like today's world where everybody's walking around with their own truth. And then we spin the truth, you know, a politician spinning the truth. Well, that might be your truth, but this, you know, so we, we get this from Washington, D.C., you know, people spinning the truth. Well, back in ancient Greece, that's what the sophists were doing. It drove Socrates crazy. He's like, no, there can't, truth can't just be opinion. There's got to be truth with a capital T. You know, it's, it's, it's there. It's ontologically real. So I, I think that that's, that's an important distinction that leave open the possibility that there's what we think about, which is thought, memory. Again, you have an experience and then it becomes knowledge, but then there's more. So that becomes past knowledge. So we're always living in memory. We're always living in thoughts. We're always living in what we're thinking. Thoughts. I shouldn't say what we're thinking about. We're living in thought, <laughs> but there's still truth with a capital T. And I'd like to suggest that somehow that, I leave open the possibility that that's there. And so what I mean is I don't, I think humans have um, the possibility of freeing themselves from thought, freeing themselves from what they call consciousness currently. You know, there might be more out there than what we think, you know? So, you know, there could be the possibility that there's more to what we're calling right now consciousness. You follow? Yeah. But if, if consciousness is thought, then does that leave out everything that can be experienced away from thought? Because like, does that leave out experiences that you can't experience yourself subjectively outside of, of thought? I guess this kind of, you can take this as like a, a solipsistic view of like, if I, if I completely think that the only experience of consciousness is my own self and the only thing that we can think about is my own thought that if consciousness oh, yeah, is yeah. thought, then that leaves out others thoughts. Oh yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, no, yeah. Don't, don't make it individual. Mm -hmm. No, no. In fact, I wanted to come back to this. We're, we're touching on this earlier. We were talking about um, the self. And again, most people think that there's a thinker called the self having thoughts. But if there's no self, 
Yeah. You know? So what I wanted to stress here is what if, what if the thinker itself is simply another thought? I mean, that's basically where Buddhism goes. There's a discovery that there's no self because the self is simply a thought. So, well, but we think it's a thinker having thoughts, yeah. but what if there's no thinker having thoughts? There's just thought that creates the thinker. And then that thinker separates itself from thought. I mean, that's basically what I see happening all the time. There's, there's no thinker having thoughts. There's simply thought creating the thinker. And then that thinker separates itself from thought. Now, when that sinks in, yeah, the first thing you notice is there's no room for, for an individual. It's just pure. When I said thought, I meant thought. You know, just human thought across the board. There's no your thoughts and my thoughts. There's just thought. That's and, correct. And or so just consciousness. Right? Just consciousness. And um, yeah, from your perspective, consciousness is thought. So right. it's, I mean, I mean, I'm trying to think about ways in which consciousness might not be thought. You see, but notice what I'm doing there. I guess in my own way, I am making a distinction between consciousness and awareness. I mean, as I said, we, we define them similarly. We say consciousness sometimes is awareness, sometimes consciousness is knowledge or thought. And I, and I do think that consciousness is certainly thought. But you see, then there's awareness. And it's almost like awareness is a little more subtle than thought. Uh, not to use the word deeper, but there's, it, I don't know what other word to use. There's thought, call it consciousness, that's what we know based on experiences that we've had. But then what about this, this seer, this observer, this awareness that seems to be a little more subtle than thought itself. Yeah. I mean, the, I think something that a lot of people, um, and, and if this is something you're not comfortable talking about, I, I totally understand. But a lot of people that come away from like psychedelic experiences, mm. um, they kind of come away with the, with, with at least a little bit more of an insight into the way that, the universe is experiencing itself. Right. Um, and you're just, whatever awareness is, is the, the universe experiencing what it is. And, and I don't know if, if that's something you've given much, much oh, thought to. Absolutely. In fact, I, when <laughs> I bring this up, I, it's funny you mentioned this because I was, again, I've been teaching this course at ASU for years and I've been noticing in the last two or three years, every time I teach this course, the students want me to talk more and more about psychedelics and I used to bring in Terrence McKenna and some of that stuff years ago. I stopped even doing that a few years ago. And all of a sudden, all they want to know about is psychedelics. So I started. So I thought to myself this year when I teach the course, why don't I dedicate at least a portion of it to the psychedelic experience, thinking that the students would be. Now, it's interesting. And I've told my students this. I'm, I'm going to do this on Tuesday. I'm finally getting to the psychedelic section on next Tuesday's class. But this particular group doesn't seem as interested as, as the other two or three years. So I don't know what's going on out there, but certainly I've thought a lot about this. And in fact, I hope to be going to a, there's a big f conference in Phoenix this year. I think it's in, in uh, May. I forget what the name of the conference is. I think it's just called the psychedelic conference in Phoenix, 2023. Oh, yeah. And there's some pretty big names there. Rick Doblin is there. And I've never met James Fetterman, but he's been around forever. He's called the father of microdosing. He's going to be there. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And I was watching a video about him yesterday, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so there's some, some real pioneers showing up. It's probably going to be a pretty big conference. But yeah, um, there's a lot to say there. I have all kinds of friends who are having wild, of course, in some states, this is not legal. In a lot of states, it's illegal. But there is, there, people are having phenomenal success using psychedelics in a therapeutic set, setting. I mean, it's just, it is helping people with PTSD disorders, alcoholism, depression. I mean, you name it. I mean, and finally, you know, we've gone through this whole cycle. Uh, you know, we had Groff in the 60s and it was still legal until they took it away from him. Everybody blames Timothy Leary, and I suppose he was very responsible for what happened. But um, but it's all coming back, you know. As you know, I mean, Colorado just legalized psilocybin. So. Yeah, Oregon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I went to so I went to a psychedelic conference, and I used to live in Oregon in Portland, and I, I went oh, to a okay. psychedelic conference out there. I'm trying to go to a, a Maps convention in Denver. Yeah, that's um, is this is Dalvin's Ma the founder of Maps? Yeah. Oh, okay, sweet. Uh, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think there's interest because it gives you. I don't know, like, and I'd be interested to hear your perspective on it. But I'll share mine. I'm always. I feel like I'm so. I guess I should say, like, I I consider myself a spiritual person, um, and 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 that kind of looks different for everybody. But they 
define as spiritual. But I think it's kind of this, for me, it's just that understanding that there's something bigger out there that I just am not going to be able to comprehend. I mean, when we look at how limited human beings are, just how, how limited we are with our own minds and our own awa- uh, ability to perceive um, what's going on. And, and when we take um, mind-altering substances and people have taken um, psychedelics, it, it, it brings you into a different realm of, a, of, of awareness. It just it brings you somewhere else. At least it opens. You know, whatever – you know, there's so many ways that people try to describe this. Dissolve the ego. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's, but it, regardless, there's, there's, there seems to be this underlying assumption that there's just something else that we just can't perceive yeah. uh, with, with, with the – with the mind that we, we, with the mental hardware that we have right now, mental and physical hardware that that we operate in most of the time, and so, you know, like I think about death a lot, and so, so it's like, for, what, what happens once this goes away? What happens when this mind um, is no longer, or at least, sorry, I should say, like this brain no longer is in existence? What does that look like? And and that it gives gives me so much to think about um and and you know i I, and i'm not really sure exactly where where this you know this this um where the end goal of this is for me but but it's something that i would like to get your perspective on like do you consider yourself a spiritual person and kind of what is your relationship with with um with death and 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 what the continuation of or non-continuation of experience well i liked your definition of spirituality uh so in that sense, I suppose I would be. I think people see me as a spiritual person based on what I talk about and what I do. And so, yeah, and I, I suppose I would be comfortable with that. Um, and I've thought a lot about death lately. Um, I've thought a lot about time more specifically than death. I've thought a lot about time. I've never thought about time, but in the last two two years or so, two or three years, I've just reading a lot of Henri Bergson. He's really changed my life uh, with regard to how he views time, the nature of time. And I've been reading a lot of uh, quantum physics and, and their relationship to time, the thinkers, which then leads you to death. I mean, you, you, and it, it then also, it, it helps you meditate on the relationship between the brain and the mind, you know. Can there be consciousness? Can there be mind without brain, you know? I mean, when, when the body goes and the brain goes with the body, what does that do to mind? Does mind survive the death of the, the body? Lots of people say yes. <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, there's this thought that, that this ties into reincarnation too. I'm still uncomfortable with the idea that, you know, when someone talks about reincarnating, they're talking about their entire character, their entire personality coming back. That to me is a real bumpy road. I don't, and if that were the, and, and, and yet, not even the Dalai Lama remembers his past lives. So there's something off about thinking that yeah, reincarnation is this notion that I'll be back, all of me. All of my thoughts will come right back just, just, just in a new vessel. I don't know. That, that doesn't quite make it for me. But Bergson felt that. So, I mean, it, you know, obviously <laughs> the jury's still out. I think it's more like at, at death, as I say, the body goes, the brain goes into the earth with the body. But mine somehow survives that. And I just think what happens is, you know, thoughts just continue. And possibly when someone's quote unquote reincarnated, the, 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 the thoughts that they had find a new vessel, but it's not, but then there's other people's thoughts too now, you know, it's kind of like this, this integration of thought, you know, entering a new vessel. And that, and that makes it more intense. If you think about it, it, it makes it here. It's like this. If you're really interested in reincarnation and karma and all that, you know, oh, you know, you're having a crappy life this time because that's some bad karma. And, you know, and you've got to behave now so that your next life you're going to have. But, you know, um, if you go with what I just said that, hey, what if it's not, you know, all your thought? It's not always just your own thought. It's not just your character that's coming into a new vessel. What if? It's all of humanity's thoughts that you got to deal with in this new vessel. See, that makes it much more intense because what that means is everything we do, our thoughts and our behavior right now, this is the key, what I'm trying to get at, right now is what matters because because that's what's going to continue. 
So, you know, otherwise it's all a cop out. A lot of people think, well, I'm behaving and thinking this way because I've just got some bad karma, you know, and I'm, I'm doomed next lifetime anyway. I'll be back. I'll try it again later. Well, no, not if it's not just you anymore. Your, your thoughts affect humanity's thoughts, you know. It's just human thought that we're, we're, we're affecting here or that we are acting out here, or that we are actually, you know. That intensifies things for me. Definitely. I, I think it, you can even take that a step further in, into thinking. You know, it's not just human thought. It's, it's all yeah, it's I was going to say, I think human, you. non-human yep. existence here. Animal um, life, plant life. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, um, everything that we do has an effect on on what comes next. Um, I mean, you, you you could discuss free will here and what, what actual, yeah, what, if any, control we have um, on, on, on what we do now affects anything moving forward. But Key question. Um, yeah. But I think um, something I, I, I kind of want to, um, touch on with what you said is like this idea of reincarnation. And I, I do feel the hesitancy as you, as you do as well with the idea that, um, me as, as a person who has a name, who has six experiences comes back in any sort of way. And I think that's like, again, like holding on to the self. It's just holding on yep, to what that's we, a good way to put it. That's a good way um, to put it. Yeah. As, as, as the self. And if we can, already agree, which I think we can kind of understand um, through meditation and through maybe psychedelic experiences, is the idea that the self isn't there. Like That, that is already something that we can see past. Um, and Well, some of us anyway. Some of us at least. <laughs> um, and so if we can, if we can, if we can use that, we can kind of set that as, as, as an, an axiom, as an axiom. Um, we can, this idea of reincarnation in that specific way just doesn't really make any sense. Yeah. And, but I think that there's this, um, the idea that we go somewhere like the energy, whatever makes up our bodies, whatever makes up our minds, um, our brains, it goes somewhere. It just doesn't disappear. Like it, it, it just goes something else. It just goes back into whatever the universe is. Um, and, and then that forms new experiences and, and, and I would be so much more comfortable. And I think that's really the way I, I am starting to lean is, is the, is that, is that sort of interpretation of reincarnation of just, it goes, our experiences, whatever this is, um, as, as whatever I think about when that ends, it just goes back into the, into the universe and, experiences something else, you know, and maybe that yeah. takes, you know, eons to do, but, but then it's like, well, what type of experience would that even, what would that even look like? And, and, and I think that kind of gets into, um, I, I don't know, it kind of gets into panpsychism. But. Well, let's talk about that because I mean, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of believing that, uh, if you're going to, again, the jury's not out on what consciousness is, what's the nature of consciousness, but I, I think it has a lot to do with the electromagnetic energy. That's my take on it. And I and it's sad what happened to the research. You know, back in the 19th century, Tesla and Heaviside and Steinmetz, these people were doing wonderful things with experiments in electromagnetism. All that went away, though, with basically Einstein comes along and gives us quanta and quanta physics. And, well, he, he gave us the theory of relativity. But that whole period there, uh, I'm told that a lot of really decent research was just stopped when we became fascinated with the experiments of Bohr and Einstein. And so the pioneers that gave us quantum physics and relativity kind of took the focus off of what others were doing with the electromagnetic research energy. And um, I think we should bring that back because, because just think about what we're talking about. We're talking about this energy that, that doesn't go anywhere. All right. Well, that could be an electromagnetic energy that's more than, physical forms, you know, flesh and bones, for instance. So I, I, I think there's something to be said for that. What type of experiments or work were they doing? Oh, well, I, you know, I was reading the other day that even FDR came into office and, and tried to make radios illegal. There, Steinmetz was doing some weird things with um, and Tesla. Again, I, I don't know enough to, to talk about the particulars of what, what their experiments were, but I guess it was really advanced and really spooky, you know, at least to the American government. And, and again, and I don't know the story behind why all of a sudden there was a spotlight on Einstein and what he was doing. And 
there's, there's a big story here with regard to what's a photon, you know, what do we mean by a quanta of energy? But I'm just saying, I, I think, I think talking about reincarnation the way we are and talking about this energy that doesn't necessarily go anywhere, it's there. It, this ties into what Sheldrake, are you familiar with the morphogenetic fields of Rupert Sheldrake, the no. biologist? Oh, you're not? No, actually. Um, yeah, well, he, he was writing in the 70s and 80s. He's still alive, doing great work. And he had this notion that every species has a, a field, a thought field, if you will. So there's one for humans, there's one for monkeys, there's one for parrots, whatever. Every single life form has a morphogenetic field. And all that means, it's a field of thought that it shares with that species. So, and, and this, this, can, this could explain certain things. Like, for instance, uh, there's a certain gorilla or something that lives on, on one continent that picks up, I'm just making this up, picks up a banana, peels it, throws the fruit away, but takes the skin and dips it into an anthill so that a bunch of ants crawl out. And then it licks the ants off the, you know, it, it wants to eat the ants. So it's figured it's got this tool now that allows it to eat candy off of a lollipop. You know, it's basically just eating the ants off the, and so this is a wonder, you know, they love this. And Sheldrake would say, now, once that, once that one monkey on that one continent learned to do that and had that experience, that's going to affect the thought forms of all other monkeys on the globe. So you can be in another continent and all of a sudden some monkey's going to have the thought, oh, what if I did this? Well, he would say, well, that's explainable because of the morphogenetic field. That's just a crazy example I just made up. But you, yeah. you get the point, right? There's just this thought field that every species shares. That's pretty – And it's electrodent. Yeah, yeah. That's, pretty, that's a pretty far out theory. I mean – um, how do you? How was that? How would that be able to be contained? What contains the thought fields? Yeah, well, that, what's a field? Yeah, that's another question. No one really knows what a field is, <laughs> so I can't answer that yeah. question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think this kind of it makes me it makes me kind of ponder what kind of the underlying problem with with everything, or I guess um, the, the kind of our underlying understanding of what anything is and 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 it's like everything can be explained by what it does i mean so physics um mm -hmm. chemistry what have you any sort of scientific understanding of anything is based on what it does um like what a cork does what a boson does um but we don't know what it is and, and i think that's something yeah. that i sort of um it kind of i i sort of uh i, I think about because what it is is very important i i like what it at least it seems to me it seems to have be it seems to be important to think about if 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 we're going to base everything off of what it does uh -huh. uh, I should probably, probably understand what it is but i mean understanding what something is 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 very i mean it it seems almost impossible to to gain any sort of yeah. um, like look at all the look at all the money spent on the research at, into what consciousness is. Some people look at that and say, well, this is a waste of time and money, you know? Same thing with AI. I mean, if you really I, I don't want to get off on AI, but there's just so much money being thrown down the drain there as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, what is consciousness, you know? Will we ever know? Uh and you're saying, well, it's important to know. But what if it's not an it? You know, what if it is just an experience? Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes um what I think is, I mean, uh, actually, I should just uh, vault the question to you. What, what do you think of, of God? What, what do you do? You think about God in a specific way, or do you not? Um, yeah, I guess I should just say that. Well, yeah, I I grew up a Roman Catholic, so God was important to me in my early years. But and I would go to mass, Christian mass, and and, and I'm I'm you know I'm happy I was raised a Roman Catholic because I'll never forget when I went to my first Protestant service. I felt like I was in a courtroom. I thought, where's the stained glass windows? Where's the ritual? Where's the mystery? You know, it was just such a freaky thing. But no, I, by the time I, I think probably started in high school, I started to read world literature and started to think about philosophical notions. And then here I am. When, when I started to major in philosophy, I, that was it. I mean, I, my Roman Catholic, you know, ties were cut. So, I mean, God is a word as far as I'm concerned. And is, in my mind, if by God you mean this mystery from where we come and where we might go after death, quote unquote, if, if you mean by God mystery, I'm fine with that. Some people don't want to use the word God, they, you know, Allah, you know, Brahman, if you're a Hindu. I, I say my students, you know, these are all, as far as I'm concerned, metaphors, you know, 
God's a metaphor. Allah is a metaphor. Brahman is a metaphor. And what's freaky is it's the metaphor, it's, it's symbolizing the same thing. They're all metaphors for the same thing. We'll call it the mystery of life. But what's sad is people get themselves attached to their metaphor and they'll kill each other over this metaphor. And this is what's behind you know, religious wars, right? Oh, your metaphor, Mom, this isn't a metaphor. This is the truth. You need to convert to my truth. That's sad because to me, God's a metaphor. Yeah, I I think about God in the same way, um, and and I you know this is a conversation that I have with my my parents or or people that are adamantly religious that God the word itself is already made up by humans the the word itself you can call it whatever it's already something that we created in some sense and even that word just doesn't even come close to what it is conceived to be. It's just so far beyond anything that we would even, even come close to understanding. And so, you know, the God for me is almost interchangeable with, with the universe, with consciousness. It's just, and I, and there might be a little bit of a differentiation between that, or you could argue that, but for me, it's like, so it's just something else that is just so far beyond anything uh, I, that we can even imagine. Yeah. So in, to be clear for me, anyway, when I said God is a metaphor, I meant God's a symbol. Yeah. Now what it symbolizes, I'm saying is this mystery that transcends thought and experience. Yeah. End of story. So you can't get stuck with, see what's going on with people is they get stuck on the symbol. Mm-hmm. They don't go past the symbol and that's not good. Why do you, why do you think that is? Uh, I think I think it's the nature of thought. I think thought seeks security. This is something I think, it, it, again, don't take my word for it, but notice that thought likes security, thought likes security. So, so if you, so this is a good way for thought to just be at peace. Oh yes, there's, there's God. And, and then again, how you, how you think about God. I mean, if, if for you, God is your protector and it's all going to work out because it's God's will and you don't have to worry about a thing because you're in God's hands. That's that, that allows thought to, okay, it's comfortable with that. You know? So I just think it's the nature of the beast. I just think thought seeks security and it seeks security in symbols. Yeah. I, I sort I, I, I sort of think this kind of gives, rise to the question of, of meaning and the way, the way we kind of view what, what meaning is, we can have a discussion like we have been on what consciousness is, what God is, what, what it means to exist or sorry, well, what existence is, but what is it, what is it for you that means to exist? What is it, you know, is there a point? And I think that's, you know, that we could get caught up in, in many different thoughts about this, um, and so I, I guess I just posed the question, like, what, what is it that you, you think we're doing here? Well, I would say meaning is being. I, I think you do not separate being from meaning itself. So f- what that should say to you is, for me, meaning is absolutely fundamental. In fact, if I were to try to, you know, create a hierarchy in my mind with my own thoughts with regard to the subject of our conversation, I would say mystery is primarily the most fun. That's, that's, that's foundation is the mystery. Interesting. But right beyond that is meaning. And I'd like to say that being is itself meaning. Now, that's a radical position, I think. I don't think a lot of people go with that, that meaning itself is being itself. Mm. Uh, so that that's that says a lot. I mean, so therefore, there's no need to, to seek the meaning of life. The meaning of life is being itself. Uh, you know, I don't know. That's... Yeah, yeah. I think the kind of the way I think about it is is through the lens of there. We're asking the wrong question if we're saying, like, what's the meaning to life when there's already so much meaning around us there's already like meaning is already here and there's and it's not just one idea it's it's many ideas it's not one single why are we trying to limit ourselves to one type of meaning and i don't know if you would agree with that well i, I i'm thinking of joseph campbell right now uh, who's come up in our conversation once or twice <laughs> he used to say you know people used to ask him that question all the time what's the meaning of life mr campbell what do you think and he would say uh, I don't. I don't think you're supposed to seek meaning at all. He says, "I seek the experience of being alive, the experience of being alive." Uh, and he used to say things like, "You know, if you're if you're living your life so bent on trying to figure out the meaning to life, you're going to lack the experience of being alive itself." Which, by the way, goes back to Camus. We, you know, the myth of Sisyphus is Sisyphus is happy when he discovers he's got experience. He's got the experience of being alive, and that's all of a sudden what really matters. 
So um, and Camus was using that as a metaphor. So I think it, there's a lot of truth to that. I don't think we're supposed to be here trying to figure out the meaning of life. I think we're supposed to be here experiencing life. Yeah. And ex- would you say that experiencing – and so you would say experiencing is the is, – Is meaning itself. Is meaning that's itself. That's what I'm saying. And, and I think that's a very interesting take that um, meaning is fundamental – and is that, that that's, that's I, I, I'm, I I pulled this out of uh, David Bohm's work. Not too many people, even people who are fans of Bohm, you know, you really got to read deeply into his work. But um, and see, it's funny. The scientists will read Bohm's scientific papers and they'll stay away from anything he had to do with Krishnamurti. And then some people come to Bohm through Krishnamurti, but then don't read the physics. But here's a scientist who was going out of his way to say as a scientist meaning is being for him as a quantum physicist the fundamental ground of the cosmos was meaning which is radical for a physicist to say that do you think there's multiple fundamental grounds like you think there's multiple fundamental natures of reality there's not just one thing well this yeah this is this is a big show i'm back in the east they've always done this they've kind of created a hierarchy ken wilbur who's still alive i think he lives in colorado he's famous for creating these hierarchies of levels of reality you know and and his work by the way is he's gone out of favor lately but i think he's still one of the greatest living philosophers alive he's done a great job of gathering all this information from all different disciplines science you name it arts philosophy psychology and he's got all these different levels, right, to the cosmos. I think, I think, uh, for me anyway, I'm just more comfortable with saying, you know, as long as I, <laughs> there's a mystery, that's the foundation. And I'm not going to get too caught into the various levels and where I'm at. Yeah. You know, that doesn't make sense to me. I think that's the fun part, isn't it? If it is meaning, or sorry, uh, mystery is the fun part of 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 existing absolutely yeah and why don't people i don't understand why that's maybe people think it but don't say they think it because to me it's like really primarily fundamentally important that you 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 live your life every day not knowing (laughs) what's going to happen because if you really pay attention you know you can get a phone call i can get a phone call in the next five minutes and our life can change radically you know i mean just like that and um i don't know it just seems important to me to live fundamentally, if possible, moment to moment in that not knowingness, that mystery. Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes to presence, what, what presence is. And this is a question I wanted to ask is what, what do you think exists beyond presence, beyond this present moment? Is there a, does the future exist? Is there you're, a you're asking about time again. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I know it's something you had. You, yeah. No, I, I, I think this is it, man. I think this is it. Um, you know, in traditional Buddhism, they would say to a Westerner, you're already in heaven, you know, to use, I'm, I'm, I'm using terms differently, of course, you know, but, but, you know, as a Christian, you, you've got this notion, oh, I'm going to go to heaven when I die, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, even though, you know, you, you pick up passage in the Bible, it's the kingdom of heaven is within you. Who's in heaven? God's in heaven. Oh, God's within you, you know, so that, that, it's all right there that the more Gnostic mystical reading of the traditional Orthodox Western Christianity but if you look at that, um, that Western notion that I need to die and then go to heaven, and yet, as I said, the mystical reading of, of a lot of the Christian texts is, well, you know, God's within you, so turn within and go to heaven. So a Buddhist would say, you, you're already in heaven. Uh, the fact that you don't think this is it, that's your problem. Those are your blinders. You know, the, word, the word Buddha, by the way, is from the Sanskrit word bodhi, which means to awake, wake up, wake up to the fact that this is it. Um, the word eternity is I use a lot in, in, in spiritual, mystical literature. And eternity, as I define it, and I think most people would agree with this, has nothing to do with time. Because we often use it, oh, meaning a long time. Oh, that took an eternity. A lot of people use the word eternity and they mean a long time. But philosophically, it just means no time at all. It, has, it, has no, it cuts time out which therefore presents the notion that this is the eternal moment. Right now is the eternal moment. Now, this gets slippery because there's a lot of people writing books and making a lot of money talking about being in the power of the now. You know, all you got to do is be here now, man. And back in the 60s, they were saying that, you know. So what? how, how does that work? 
how, how do I be in the now? And people, again, are working real hard at trying to be in the now. Right? Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> you I'm, trying, I'm working real hard on trying to be in the now. <laughs> Um, well, you know, that that's a good meditation, though. I mean, do you really need to work that hard at it, right? Yeah. Well, I think it's – I think it – I believe it kind of comes down to the awareness that it's so far in front – it's so close to you that it's so hard to see. Um, the present moment, whatever that is, like whatever this is, is it's so yeah, close to you and it's, it's, it, that it's – it almost is blinding how close yeah. it is to you. So I think it's an old thing. It's like, it's like, it's closer than your neck vein, you know, or it's like, it's right there, you know, uh, but, but that's what makes it there. difficult to find or at least well, realize, but ask yourself the where. question, why, why can't, what, what's, what's the obstacle for humanity to, to be in the now? What, what's, what is the ultimate problem here? What is it that prevents us from being present right now? What is, what is it that's presenting, preventing us from being eternally to, to living in eternity. What is it? I don't know. I mean, I'm inclined to say re- awareness. I, I awareness would say it's thought. Well, you could, but I guess it's our awareness of thought. Well, no, I would say thought is the obstacle though. You see, like we were getting at earlier today, I think that thought, because we don't pay attention to thought and I, I, I'm adamant about this. I, I don't think a lot of people f- pay attention put awareness on thought. We think about thought and we think all these different thoughts, but we don't really put awareness on thought. And I'm saying here right now, I think thought is itself the obstacle which prevents us from being present. We're we're always thinking. We're constantly going. We're not even aware of that. Now, once you become aware of that, then, okay, now you're paying attention to the, the fact that you're thinking all the time. And then mindfulness is, okay, paying attention to what you're thinking about. But mindfulness hasn't made a real big impact on humanity for the most part. I mean, it's helping people maybe personally, but it hasn't transformed planet Earth, people being more mindful. There's something lacking there. And I think it's because I think it's more powerful to put conscious awareness on the function of thought as opposed to what we're thinking about, the content of thought. So I'm saying thought is the obstacle, but we don't see that. And we need to see it. We need to actually watch what thought is doing to us. And it's preventing us from being present to each other. So therefore, I don't listen to you very effectively, vice versa. And this is the issue. Yeah, um, I, I would I would agree with that. Um, I think the only thing I would, I, if I were to add anything, I think it's almost, and I don't know if this is taking it a step further or just um, a, a, just a, an adjacent point, being, if you're not aware of, and I'm not sure how to put this, but thought not recognizing thought is is what i think inhibits us from making uh, or being present but at the same time there's still even if you aren't thinking about what thought is there's still an awareness there that something is happening i don't know and and let's make a distinction between again it's not important to me anyway to be paying attention to what we're thinking about what thought is it's more of what it's doing what is the activity of thought what's behind its function to mm-hmm. me that's the key yeah um and what was the, what was the last point you were saying? i don't know if there is there was really a last point um but i think it, it was just my own reflection on how i think about thought and i and i'm and i'm trying to really self-reflect as i am even right now in this moment like how am i um how am i what is my relationship to this present moment right now? And, and it's just my own reflection on that. And I, I, I thought is a key to that. I, I, I 100% agree. I, I mean, it, it, I, I would even, you know, I would agree that thought is the one thing that is inhibiting us from being present. Can I, can I stop you right there? Yes. I don't know if it's thought as much to the, as, as much as the activity of thought, the activity, what of thought. thought is doing. To okay. me. That's a distinction that's important. Yeah. You know, I don't think thought's a problem, but what it's doing, we're, we're unaware of what it's doing. It's the lack of awareness yes. of what and, thought is doing. And I, I think that is, that's the point that I was trying to get at. I okay. think you make it clear. All right. Um, it's, it's the, it's the, what thought is doing to us. And if you're not aware of what thought is doing to us, then thought can take you into, That's... lead you down the path. And for me, what thought, uh, recognizing what thought is doing to us is awareness. And I think that's why I said awareness in the beginning, but it's all, it's all connected. It's all, it's all there. But yeah, I mean, I, I, 
these these questions are are, are well, I, very important. What's coming out of it is we, we you know we do we we've, we've made a distinction which I think is important between thought and awareness. I do think those are two different phenomenal. Uh, I, I guess they're experiences, right? Yeah, totally. So I definitely would agree with that. And it's coming to the end of our our time here. I just want to uh, give you give you some time to mention anything that you're working on, anything that you're doing um, that you think is important to you that you want to share with uh, with whoever might be listening to this, and anything else that you might want to get out there. I'm pretty good, you know. I'm I'm working on some things, working on some projects with some different scholars and whatnot that that are active in the field of consciousness studies, but those things still have to kind of come to fruition. I'm in the middle of it. Yeah, totally. But I, I'm, I'm just teaching a lot. And as I've said, um, I hope that once I get close to retirement, I can start to write some more. Yeah, I'm totally. Right now. What, what was it that, uh, that you, you chose not to write? Well, why, why oh, did you no, choose not yeah, to write? That, that's a good question. Within your academic career. No, I, uh, I guess as a young man, I had a chip on my shoulder. You know, I, I, uh, I never, well, I, I always wanted to be a teacher. Like I said to you, I didn't know what kind of a teacher. Uh, being a professor seemed to make more sense because I don't have a lot of patience with young folks. So I knew that high school would be a challenge to teach. But somehow when I was, when I was getting my doctorate, my interests were so unacademic. They were so, you know, like, oh, you can't study that. Even, you know, in this institution of higher learning, I was already out on the fringes and so that, that gave me a bad taste in my mouth. I just thought, well, that's kind of a dead. That's why I went into corporate consulting for 10, 15 years. I didn't even enter academia until I was in my late 30s, mid 30s, late 30s, I guess. Um, so I, I just decided that um, I, I made a conscious decision not to write and because I wanted to teach and I knew I would. I was already teaching you know, part time here and there as I was doing the consulting work. So I, you know. I started doing that back at Bowling Green State as a graduate student. So I, I love that. I always love that. I remember teaching my first st- a college course as a graduate student. It was an American studies course. And I went in there and I just, I just knew from day one, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So I've always been doing that here and there. Um, but I made a conscious decision not to write. But then as I started to teach so much and started to uh, meet all these interesting people who were writing – I feel like I have uh, the skill to be a decent writer. I'm told that. I just haven't put any effort into doing it. So I thought, okay, well, now when I, as I get older here and I'm winding down my full-time teaching career, maybe I can start to write. But So that's what's coming next. Yeah, awesome. That, that's super cool. I mean, yeah. it's definitely a skill like any other. It's writing is, is – like speaking is a skill and then writing is a yeah, skill. Yeah, I, I love both. Yeah. yeah. Totally. I have a, two questions actually. Two last questions here. Um, one being, for me, I I'm not someone who I never went to university. I just am doing my own things autodidactically. But what what advice would you give to me as someone who who likes to learn? And and the the one thing that does keep me from going into university is the fact that I love to do so many other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that it's gonna. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but I know that it's gonna take so much of my energy mentally. And physically to to pursue a, a degree in in university. So, what what would you say to somebody like in my position that that has some uh, some experience, some life experience, but also is immensely interested in these sorts of things, yet may not see themselves going into university right at this this moment? Yeah, that, that's a challenge. I I totally resonate with what you're saying. Well, the first thing is to not lose touch with your own creative juices. If that's what grounds you in your work, then you have to stay grounded in that. But it's just a fact in this culture in this particular culture, that having a degree does open doors. Um, but as you say, this takes a time commitment. It takes a time management commitment. You've got to learn how to manage your time effectively. Otherwise, you can wind yourself. You feel schizophrenic if you don't know how to manage time. So I would say maybe the thing to do is to do focus on your, your, your bliss, focus on what it is that makes you happy with your creative side. But then maybe slowly just get your foot in the door and work toward a degree. Don't go full blast because it sounds like that would be just a bit too challenging because you've got all these other interests. You want to keep going and focus on that, which I totally get. There's two ways to do this. You could do what I did, which is just go full blast, you know, just blinders on and just go get it. But at this point in your career, that might not be as easy. I was a young man when I did that. So I would say don't lose touch with yourself. 
But if it is important for you, if you, and this might not be the case, but if you, if you see and you decide, ah, I do need that degree, then I would say just start slow. Awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point just because in my head, it's always, it's always been a goal of mine to get a degree. Oh, there um, you go. See? But, it, yeah, is it, but it's not – but it, again, it's like – all right, I, my my personality is go full blast into things. Oh, like, is it? So okay. it's like you commit or you don't commit. And I okay. did go to, you know, I've taken some college classes, but um, also last question, I'm putting together a playlist. What 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 music are you? What is the most? What are you most excited about listening to right now? You know, it's, uh, it's, are you a music person? I should. I, first I that. always was a music person. Of course, because of my age, I grew up with rock and roll. Um, so for me, I mean, I I grew up listening to. Pink Floyd. In fact, I can still listen to Pink Floyd. Um, but I was an old rocker, you know, Led Zeppelin, and uh, all the classic. Yeah. But anyway, I, uh, I don't listen to music anymore. Really? I, you don't? I, I, and I, I, it dawned on me, I was telling this to a friend the other day, because all my friends still listen to music. Uh, I don't have a car. I got rid of my car purposely years ago. I moved downtown to commute, you know, I, yeah, yeah. and it's saving me money and helping the environment. And I feel good about myself, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, because of that, cause I used to always listen to the, to music driving the car. Um, I just don't listen to music anymore. And it, 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 it has to do with quite honestly, I don't know. I'm becoming far more comfortable with silence. I, I love, I love sitting in a room with silence I just think that's so much fuller. It's it's just yeah. To me, it's a, it's a it's a fuller experience. So no recommendations. No, I don't. Um, all I right, don't. hey, you're not the first person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate you being on. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate this conversation. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's a good time.